Well, good morning. Uh, this is uh, week number three of uh, our uh, recorded Sunday morning messages. And so I, I'm looking out at a, a, a more or less empty meeting room, and I, I would much rather be looking at all of you, but uh, I'm really thankful for the technology and for our production team, uh, Jeff and Luke, who are here again today uh, taping this. So uh, we are continuing our series in uh, the book of Mark, the Holy Week series, and and today we're going to, to go through the uh, uh, betrayal, trial uh, of, of Jesus as he's approaching his crucifixion. And, yeah, and it's found in Mark uh, 32 through, uh, 15, 14, 32 through 15, 20. And um, where we are in the, in the uh, scene here is that uh, as, as Rob uh, spoke last week, uh, the Last Supper has just occurred. The disciples gathered, uh, celebrating a Passover meal. Um, they, uh, Jesus uh, predicted uh, Judas' betrayal. He predicted uh, Peter's denial. And uh, then they ended. And we're picking it up where they leave the city. They're, they were in Jerusalem meeting. Uh, as you know, uh, prior they were commuting back and forth to Bethany. They, they were in Jerusalem for the meal. And now they went, uh, they're going out into the garden. And so um, I'll pray and, and we'll... Uh, get into this passage. Father, thank you uh, that you are present with us wherever we are. We're scattered about the area, and, uh, uh, but we're glad that you're with us, and you can uh, give us unity even as we're apart. So we thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Help us to enter into this, these events as recorded by Mark and, and uh, understand a little bit more about uh, what was going on and what it means to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to pick up the story there. And, and again, as, as Mark writes, um, he writes in kind of scenes and very succinctly and, and moves from scene to scene. And so uh, we're going to go through those scenes that are in this portion and uh, take a look. I'll just uh, read through the portions and, and make some observations. And then, uh, and, and then there's a uh, kind of a connection I want to make uh, after. So in uh, Mark 14, 32. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. It's just outside of Jerusalem. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. So Jesus is, is he took all his disciples with him, and then he chose the, two, the three that were uh, closest to him and, and takes them a little farther into the garden. And then he, he asks him, he, he asks him a favor, really. He says, Stay with me and watch. He says, I, I'm troubled greatly distressed. And, and uh, you get the picture here that Jesus is going, he, he knows what's coming. And sometimes when we, when we uh, there's something that we know is coming, it maybe doesn't seem quite so ominous when it's a little ways off. But you know, as it gets closer and closer, the reality of it begins to weigh on us. And, and I, th I think that's what's happening here with Jesus. He knew what was coming and now it's, it's not off in the distance. It's not something that is going to happen someday, but it's going to happen tonight and tomorrow. And that, and that weighs heavily on, on, on Jesus. And oftentimes I think we, we think, well, well, Jesus was Jesus, and so this was not a, a big deal. That's what he came for, right? He, that's what he signed up for. And, and that's true. But Jesus was a man. Jesus was flesh and blood like, like you and I. And, and so as he is, he knows what's coming, he's greatly dis, 
distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. He, in other words, I feel like dying. I feel like dying. I'm, I'm so distressed, so sorrowful, so sad about this, so disturbed. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. He asked his father, can't you remove this? Can't we do this another way? Yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping. He came back to his three disciples and they're sleeping. And he said to Peter, he picked out Peter particularly, Simon, Peter's other name, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So Jesus had asked them to watch, and, and they were not able to stay awake. And I, I think, I wonder, the, the trouble of their friend Jesus, the one they've been following for these years, wasn't enough to keep them awake. They were willing, as Jesus, uh, as Peter had stated just prior, at, uh, uh, at the end of the portion Rob talked about on, uh, last week, Peter was adamant, I won't, I won't leave you. He was willing. He was, he was determined, but, but he was, his flesh was weak. And so Jesus again went into the garden, or further into the garden, and he prayed the same prayer to his father. Again, came back, the disciples are asleep a, a second time. And he goes back and he prays to his father a third time and comes back and he, he sees his disciples asleep and he says, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It's enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise. Let us be going. My, my betrayer is at hand. So one of the observations I'd make here is that Jesus began to be alone. In, in, as he walked into this uh, trial, into this trouble, into his crucifixion, he began to be alone even here in the garden. His disciples were asleep. His di disciples were asleep in his hour of need. He began to be left alone. So going on to the, he says, and immediately, verse 43, immediately while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign. The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. Jesus was betrayed by a, his, his friend, one of his disciples, one of the men that had been close to him for three years. He was betrayed. And not only betrayed in a, uh, in a way that would make, uh, inconvenience him, that would um, put him in a bad light maybe, but he was betrayed to death. This is a friend that betrayed him. And and that's, that had to be devastating. Have you, if you've been betrayed by a friend, if, you've been, if they've turned their loyalty and, and, and come out against you, that, that's heartbreaking. And Jesus had to have been heartbroken. This man that he had invested in, time and, and love and, and fellowship, turned on him and turned him over to the group of people that wanted, him, wanted Jesus dead. They had determined that they wanted him dead. And now Judas had a hand in that, helping them carry that out. And now it says they laid hands on him and seized them. But one of those who stood by, and in other gospels it's identified, this is Peter, drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to him, Have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? 
Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me, but the scriptures, let the scriptures be fulfilled. And so oftentimes we think of this scene as a well-orchestrated or almost scripted interaction where this crowd comes, Jesus and his disciples are on one side of the line, and they're over there, and they have this conversation. But uh, imagine this, it's, it's the middle of the night. Um, Jesus had been praying. They'd been in the, the garden at least a couple hours. He had gone into the, and, and prayed for, I think it says an hour the first time. He'd, they'd been there for some time. And so this is in, probably in the wee hours of the morning. And uh, they didn't have the advantage of flashlights, <laughs> floodlights, streetlights, anything like that. Um, I, I suspect that Jesus and his disciples had no lights at all. And the crowd, the mob that came out for Jesus had torches. And so it's a, it's a dark situation. There's at least, um, well, I, I, I would say at least 13 people in Jesus' group because there was the 11 disciples, there was Jesus, and then there was this young man that we'll talk about briefly in a minute. And then there was the mob from town from, from, the, uh, from Jerusalem coming to get him. And so this was a chaotic situation. This was in the dark. They were grabbing Jesus. There was a scuffle. There was pushing, shoving, probably some shouting. Peter pulled out a, a weapon and took off the ear of one of the chief priest's servants. And, you know, Peter, we, we often think about Peter's denial and Peter's uh, failures, but he, he did step up at this point. To a, certain, to a certain point, he did. And, uh, but eventually, when it got heated, when the dust cleared, it says in verse 50, and they all left him and fled. So all of Jesus' disciples turned tail and ran. They all, they all fled. Uh, so Jesus was again left alone. Now, before it was his disciples were asleep while he struggled, and now they're physically gone. They've, they've left. He's alone with his, with his captors. And there's an, the next couple verses, an interesting little passage <clears throat> says, and it's, and it's only recorded in, in Mark's gospel. There's four gospels. It's only recorded here. It says, and a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth around his body. And they seized him. So this, this tells me that they came for Jesus, but they were grabbing others as well. And so when the disciples fled, it wasn't, well, you got Jesus. I, I know you're not after us. We'll, we'll leave. They were grabbing others as well. And they grabbed this young man, and he resisted, and they ended up holding the, his a linen sheet that he was wrapped in, and he ran off naked. Now, there's a lot of uh, people that speculate who this might have been because he's not named here. And the most uh, common uh, thought is that this was Mark himself, the writer of this gospel. Because one, is he included in this book, and two, he knows the details of the situation that he um, ran off uh, without clothes. But that's the mystery youth. So there was a scuffle, there was, a, there was chaos, and Jesus is now left alone with his captors. So they took him um, back into the city, and he faces his accusers in, in verse 53. And they led Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. And Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. So they took him to the high priest's home, and, and there was a courtyard. And so um, Peter had run off from the garden, but he kept an eye on things and stayed close enough and, and he went into the, he ventured into the courtyard of the chief priest's home there where they took Jesus. And he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. So they were seeking to uh, find out where Jesus had broken the law, had instigated a riot or something that they could bring charges against him worthy of death 
because they needed to make a case with the, with the government, the Roman government, to have permission to, to execute Jesus. And, and they had witnesses. It says many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even about this, their tes- testimony did not agree. So they, they, nothing would stick. Nothing would stick. He was innocent. Innocent of any wrongdoing. And the, and the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. Again the high priest asked him. And here we're getting down to the really the the nitty-gritty, what they had uh, uh, against Jesus. Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? In other words, are you the Messiah? Are you the one we've been waiting for, the one that was the prophesied that's going to come and save us, that's going to be our Savior? Are you the Messiah, the Son of God, the, the Blessed? And here Jesus was, was straight with him. He answered the question plainly. And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And so Jesus told them, he, he, he was plain with them, I am indeed. I'm the Messiah. I'm the Son of God. And that's who he had been telling, saying he was and demonstrating for the last three years during his, during his ministry. And they had not uh, accepted it then during that time, and they didn't accept it now. You know, he was, he was innocent and, and so falsely accused. If you've ever been falsely accused of something that you are innocent of, but you've been accused of it, I mean, that's hard to take. We, we cry injustice. We're indignant. And Jesus, he had, they had no right to accuse him of any wrongdoing, and yet he was silent before them. But when they asked him directly, are you the Christ, are you the Messiah that we're waiting for? And he said yes. Then it turns violent. It turns violent. The, the high priest tore his garments and said, what further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him, to cover his face and to strike him, saying to him, prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. So it turned violent. He was condemned. They, when he said he was the Messiah, they couldn't accept that. They would not accept that. To, to them, that was blasphemy. And they... And they began to lash out in, in mockery, in anger, in violence, striking him, mocking him. And the guards received him with blows. The guards were hitting him. So he was innocent. He was falsely accused. And then it turned violent. And he was, he was mocked and assaulted for telling the truth, for uh, telling them who indeed he was. Going on, in verse 66, And as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came, and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with the Nazarene, Jesus. But he denied it saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway, and the rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, this man is one of them. But again he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. 
and immediately the rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. Jesus, or Peter was just yards away from where Jesus was being uh, falsely accused, found innocent, then condemned and mocked and assault, physically assaulted. He was just yards away. He wasn't, it wasn't like he was out in the, the parking lot of Lambeau Field and this was going on at, on, the, on the field. He was just outside the house. Jesus was inside. And, and Peter, one of his closest disciples, one of his most zealous disciples, was outside denying that he even knew who Jesus was. He didn't even say, oh, yeah, I, I heard that guy speak a couple times. Yeah, I'm from Galilee. I've heard about Jesus. He denied even knowing who Jesus was. And when Peter realized what he'd done, you know, Jesus had just a few hours earlier had predicted to Peter in front of all the other disciples, had predicted to Peter that this was going to happen. <clears throat> and, and we remember Peter's response. No, it won't. It will not. It will not happen. I will not deny you. And then Peter did exactly what Jesus said he would. And when the reality of that, when, Jesus, or when Peter realized, <clears throat> I, I did that. I did exactly what Jesus said I was going to do. And he wept. He was disappointed in himself. Going on in now chapter 15, and as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him to, over to Pilate. Now Pilate was the governor, the Roman appointed governor there, <clears throat> and he, um, he was the official that they needed to deal with as far as uh, taking action against Jesus. And uh, they delivered him over to Pilate, and Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, uh, you've said so. And the chief priest accused him of many things, and Pilate again asked him, have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked, and among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And then Pilate asked, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? And they said, because it says here in verse 10, for he perceived, Pilate perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priest had delivered him up. And so it's interesting that the, that the civil authority here, the governor, recognized, one, he recognized Jesus' innocence. He, he thought, I can release this guy. There's no charges against him that stick. There's nothing here that warrant what they're asking for. And so he, he tried to release him. And he, he recognized that the ones that brought Jesus to him were doing that out of envy. That, that they didn't like Jesus maybe being a greater authority than them. And, and so he recognized that and tried to, to spare Jesus' life. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call king of the Jews? And they cried out, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, why? What evil has he done? And they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And so Pilate recognized his innocence, but because of the crowd, because he didn't want a riot on his hands, because he didn't want uh, uh, to destabilize the, the city, he condemned Jesus to death. He went along with their plan to satisfy the crowd. And then, finally, 
he's turned over to be crucified in, to these Roman soldiers. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion. And they clothed him in a purple cloak and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him and they began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put on his own clothes on him and they led him out to crucify him. These soldiers, they, they, they had not been offended by Jesus. They weren't probably devout Jews that had opinions about who the Messiah was. But this condemned man, they, they piled on. You know, they, they didn't have a dog in the fight, but they took advantage of the situation and, and brutalized a condemned man. And then they led him out to be crucified. So one of the things that, something that stood out to me as I, as I looked at this passage and, and, and meditated on it is that the, the gospel, the good news about what God did as Jesus went to the crucifixion is demonstrated in this, uh, these situations. As Jesus began to, to move towards his crucifixion, he demonstrated the depths of his love as he was condemned, mocked, and brutalized while his disciple Peter denied him just outside. Those two things going on, presumably simultaneously, while Jesus was being tried, if you want to call it a trial, and, and being mocked, Peter, his close friend, is outside denying that he even knows him. And those two things just are in kind of in stark contrast to each other, but I believe it demonstrates the gospel message. Uh, Tim Keller, a, a pastor of a church in, uh, in, in a writer, a church in New York City and a, and a writer, has described the gospel, I think, in a very uh, uh, insightful way. And what he says in this simple sentence, the gospel is, we are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we dared believe. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus than we dared hope. So let's look at this a little bit. Peter, Peter in this situation. Who, who was Peter? I just want to reflect on a, on a, uh, a passage here back in uh, Matthew 16 uh, where Jesus was uh, saying, uh, talking to his disciples. It was during his ministry. And he's, uh, people are saying different things about him. And, and Jesus asked his disciples, so who, who, do, who are people saying that I am? And he says, some of them say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And, and then he says, but who do you say that I am? And it says Simon Peter in, in chapter 16, verse 16, it says, Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ the son of the living God. That's the very question that the chief priest asked. Are you the Christ, the son of the living God? And here Peter states, that is indeed is who you are, Jesus. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So, so Peter, he got it. He knew who Jesus was. He, he received the truth about Jesus. As he watched Jesus closely, he said, you are the Christ. You are the Son of the living God. And then it goes on. He says, Jesus says, and I tell you, you are Peter. So he was Simon, but you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So, and, so Jesus told Peter, when, when Peter made that statement about him, he says, and, and you're the rock on which I'm going to build my church. And so Peter was going to be instrumental in taking the message of Jesus 
gospel forward in establishing the church. So Peter was a significant individual and, with, and, and Jesus had great confidence in him. And yet, and, and, and at the Last Supper, when Jesus says, you're going to deny me, Peter boldly states, no, I won't. And yet, he can't stay awake in the garden. When, when Jesus is troubled to the point of death, Peter falls asleep. And Jesus points, he speaks specifically to Peter. He, James and John kind of got off easy. But he asks Peter, can't you stay awake? And then he flees when the trouble comes. And then he circles back and stays fairly close, but then denies that he even knows Jesus, even as Jesus is being falsely accused, mocked, and beaten. And, you know, this is recorded in all four Gospels. You know, the, the four Gospels are accounts by, written by different people of Jesus' life and ministry. And in every one of them, they, Jesus predicts Peter's denial. Peter deny he he denies that's going to happen and then it records how it does happen in every one of the four gospels it's recorded for all history you know it's 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 one thing to have our actions recorded when it's something we do that's embarrassing maybe you know if somebody catches a video of us tripping and falling or or saying something you know you know stumbling over our words or whatnot but when people, if people record something that you do that's selfish, that's cowardly, that's um, weak, that, that's, that's a little harder to take. But this is recorded in all four Gospels about this, the rock, Peter. And that's, I believe that's significant. Because... Like it's like in in uh, in Tim Keller's description of the gospel, we're more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we dared believe. Peter didn't believe that he would deny Jesus. He wasn't just blowing smoke when he told Jesus, "No, I won't." Peter didn't believe it. He didn't believe it. He didn't know himself as well as Jesus knew him. And, and so then when it did happen, and when he did do it, he was, in one sense, was he surprised? Was he, he was distressed. He wept when he recognized that he had failed. And then along those same lines, there's a, in, in verse, uh, in, back in Mark fourteen fifty. It, it says in the garden when, when chaos ensued and there was some pushing and shoving and when it was all said and done, it says they all fled. They all fled. And I, I, I thought about this. I thought, what if, what if a couple of the disciples had, had stayed in there, hadn't fled, and they had stayed and they either got arrested with Jesus or even killed I mean, that, that's possible, but, but it didn't happen. I believe God's sovereign. If, if that had happened, if, if there were, let's say, two disciples that stayed <clears throat> and, and the, rest, the other nine at this point fled, and, and, and Peter was one of those that fled and he later denied knowing Jesus, but these two stuck it out and they suffered harm for it. Today, in 2020, as I read, if I, if I read that account, who would I want to identify with? <laughs> I would identify with the guys who stayed, right? Who would, who would identify with a failure? Who would identify with Peter? Not, none of us would want to. We'd want to identify ones that stuck. Oh, I would, have, I would have done what they did. I wouldn't have done what Peter did. I would have stuck it. I would have, I would have stood by him. But they all fled. They all fled. If we're honest, we identify with Peter's weakness. You know, last week, Rob talked about that when Peter, we, we, we admire Peter's spirit 
who admires Peter's spirit and saying, no, Jesus, I, I won't leave you. I won't forsake you. But we can identify with his weakness. I believe if we're honest, we have to identify with our weakness. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we dare believe. In, in Jesus moved toward the cross knowing that his closest followers would fail him. He predicted it. He knew it would happen. And that's the part of the gospel that says at the very same time we are more loved and accepted in Jesus than we dared hope. We tend to under, underestimate God's love and acceptance. We think, well, he couldn't, he couldn't forgive me after what I've done. He couldn't forgive me if he knew what a failure I am sometimes. But that's, that's the gospel. When, when Jesus was being, when, as he was moving into his sacrifice, as he was being found innocent but condemned, mocked and assaulted, he, was, he knew what Peter was doing outside and he was, he was going forward on Peter's behalf. He didn't say, well, this isn't for Peter now. It was for Peter and it was for me and it was for you. Jesus moved ahead we are more loved and accepted in Jesus than we dare hope. So when I fail, am I, is God far from me? If, is Jesus, okay, Mark, you messed up again. I'm done with you. Fortunately not. Fortunately not. Let's look at a, a, a verse in, a couple verses in Romans that, and we'll wrap up here. And, and these are, such significant truth in these verses. It says in verse 6, Romans 5, 6, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. And then down in 8, But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That is the gospel in a nutshell. While we were weak, while... Peter was denying Jesus. Jesus was going to the cross for him. While we were still sinners, it says, Christ died for us. So that's th those two events, those two situations happening at the same time, I think, are just, a, just such a picture of what the gospel means even today, that if we're honest, we know that we aren't all that we should be. And yet that doesn't keep us away. We are accepted. While we were weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's, that's us. If we're honest, that's us. All fled. We can't identify with a, a disciple that hung in there. But we can identify with Peter. And he is... He is broadcast there he is he is front and center in this as one who failed his savior and yet it's not about peter it's about jesus it's about what jesus did on peter's behalf jesus knew peter would fail he'd predicted it he had predicted it hours before so he wasn't surprised so Jesus walked into his sacrifice with Peter in mind. It was for Peter and all sinners that Jesus came and died and laid down his life. In uh, the Romans 5.10, it says, for, if, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. We were reconciled, we were brought back that's the, that's the gospel. We were brought back. 
by the death of his son, Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this message. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for the, the truth that you died on behalf of sinners. You didn't come for the righteous. You didn't come for those that were healthy. You came for sinners. And you laid down your life for those who were far from you, who were, it says here, who were your enemies, who were weak. And God, I pray that we would recognize that that, that's us. That's us. Jesus, you, you move forward into your sacrifice with Peter in mind, despite the fact that he was letting you down. But you went forward for Peter and for us. Thank you. In your name, amen.